This is video number four or five of my heat pump water heater. Um, just got this in yesterday. So this is how it's set up in the house. How I'm controlling my thermostat water temperature. This is a little Chinese $15, $20 uh, temperature controlled relay. So there's one relay in here. You can send up to 10 amps through it. I'm not sending any amps. I'm just using it as a switch. And then I have this set at 125 and uh, with a 10 degree drop. So watch, I'll show you. So that's the drop setting. So it's set that when it drops 10 degrees to 115, it will, uh, you know, kick on. You can set it to whatever you want. And I just tucked in the thermostat wire right next to where the original top element water heater was. Um, and it's practically 100% dead on. I went upstairs and turned on the hot water. It's maybe two degrees difference. <sighs> then next, how did I do the rest of the wiring? So everything came out of the mini split. I took it apart. The LG is the easiest one to ever take apart. I've taken a few apart. This one's built very simply. There was maybe a handful of six screws that I had to take out to disassemble the whole thing. What you're going to need to take out is the motor. Leave that plugged in. Everything else, it doesn't care if you disconnect. So one of these is the emergency auto button if you lose your remote so you can activate it. This is going to be the actuator for the fan louver. And then this is, I think, the side-to-side -side fan louver actuator. This on the bottom, that was just for the external thermostat. Um, so basically, all you're going to need is the motor connected to it. It wants to know that it's trying to spin the motor. Why I'm seeing an error code is because that is how I'm controlling my temperature. So what it's calling for is saying the mid-pipe temperature sensor is disconnected. My mid-pipe temperature sensor is connected on the outlet, the bottom of the tank. So this is where the cooled off Freon, well, it's still about 105 degrees, is coming out. I just used a bunch of aluminum foil, wrapped it around. So this wire is connected right up into the mini split brain box. Over here, I snipped one wire and I split it into two and I sent it into this switch. So when this says, hey, the water temperature is 125, it disconnects the one wire from the mini splits computer, which then gives it a code and shuts it off. Works flawlessly. It doesn't shut off after a while and, or give up. It just keeps flashing at you. And as soon as my relay says, hey, it's time to call for heat, it will reconnect that temperature sensor wire. And that goes right back to working just like you said it. I have that set to always 86 degrees to force it to call for highest heating and the highest fan speed. Um, so that's the indoor part. If anybody else is interested, uh, well, I have this taped up, I'll show on the bottom, but this is where I went from the quarter to three eighths. So this is the suction line size and this is the liquid line size. So the liquid line starts all the way outside, goes into the bottom of the tank, coils around 90 feet comes out and then I have to connect it to a 3 8 line so then I did the union flare fitting connected it and that goes out side to the mini split how I connected everything originally so I still have my drain valve and I still have my pressure relief valve up there just I have to get like a three and a half inch extension because that's pretty deep and then to your T and then you know have the original factory piece on there and what goes through here is your quarter inch HVAC line I went from a three quarter to a three eighths reducer and then on Amazon I got a three eighths to one quarter um, compression fitting now mind you I'm gonna just re say what I said in other videos this is designed to have a copper tube of quarter inch fit up to here and stop and then you have your ring in here, and then you screw this on and it tightens down. Fairly simple concept. I need this to go through and through, so all I did is I drilled this 
all the way through solid. It already has a hole, I just made it big enough to where this tube can comfortably slide through. And then I put some goop on, it's the Permatex stuff for vehicles, I use that on all my fittings instead of Teflon tape. It has PTFE in it as well. And uh, that way I could slide everything over this tube, run the tube inside, coil it and you know come out from the other end. Um, that's not how I placed it inside. So how I placed the tube inside is I made my rack. I coiled it and I left like 10 feet on this side and a foot on the on the top. And uh, I carefully had somebody help me. We lowered the long end of the coil, brought it out the bottom of the tank, and then lowered the rack with the coil inside. And then I, you know, pushed out the other one and a half feet from the other end. So now we'll go outside and uh, I'll show you how it's done outside. Uh, here I just have this in towels because I need to make sure nothing's gonna leak. And it's actually almost not warm to the touch. The water being 120 degrees, it's not losing much heat at all. This would be hot if it was. So, you can see what looks like glue because that's what it is. So I, I welded my lid back on. After welding the lid back on, I wire brushed it very well and went and used a whole pack of JB Weld, the 24 hour stuff that's uh, it's a lot better. Um, adhesion and strength and tensile strength and compression strength, everything about it is better. Anything that's done fast is always worse. So I used the JB Weld glue, two part glue, and I went around the whole weld seam, probably an inch on the bottom and an inch on the top just in case there's pinholes, because a JB Weld will hold the pinholes from uh, from the water coming out, no problems. I, and while I was welding, you know, somebody's gonna look at this and say, you're right next to foam. Yeah, it catches on fire right away. Just grab a wet rag, soak it so it's dripping, and then I laid it right on the foam, and I welded for half an hour like that, and no problem. The sparks go on the wet rag, and you know, there's no fire, not the kind of fire. Um, also, what I suggest to anybody putting in a water heater, I mean, I think this is only an inch or inch and a half foam. Put your water heater on a foam pad. This is the 25 PSI foam. It's not going to go anywhere. You can stand on this with your foot and you can't even push it down. So the amount of surface area the tank has, it's never going to compress through this. Under this tank, this tank is built, beveled up. There is a hole probably four inches around. You could stick your hand in there and the metal tank is right there. There's practically no insulation there. So if you don't want 50 degree concrete cooling your tank off 24 hours a day, throw it on a slab of foam and you know, fix that problem for yourself. And we'll go outside. So I have the LG right next to my Fujitsu, which heats my house. It's a 15 RLS 3H. And the LG is right next to it. If you look at them, LG is bigger, um, which is interesting, even though it's worse all the way around in efficiency numbers. That's, that actually works like an 18. That's what it's rated at 18,000 BTUs of heating and cooling, but it's called a 15. And that's a LG 120HYV3. Even by the thickness, so if you see how thick that is, that's probably 20, 30% thicker. While I'm at this, just to give you guys a heads up, the LG has worse HSPF with its heating seasonal performance fracture. Fracture. It is worse than the Fujitsu. The Fujitsu is, I think, 13.2, even though it's a large unit, and that's 12.5 for the 12K. When you actually look at the numbers though, this gives you better performance all the way around, which is, I don't know how the HSPF calculator works. I don't necessarily look at that. I know it includes defrost as well, so maybe they heavily rely on that, but they do not calculate your HSPF value for heating. It is prime, if you, there is like a 40 page write up on, on the system, so most of the calculation is based on 47 degrees, part of it in the 30s, and very little part of the rating is in 17 degrees, or practically nothing is at five. 
I don't care how good it is at 47 because any unit is good at 47 and I don't care about that because your usage is so low I wouldn't care if I had 40% worse efficiency because I'm only using so little so your loss is less if your use is less what you're looking at is good number when your usage is high that's what you're looking at kind of like a diesel truck it doesn't get great gas mileage empty it gets good gas mileage fuel mileage but when you load it up it doesn't really change too much it is worse but it's not horrendous that's how the lg works at five degrees full blast it's still running at 300 percent efficiency that's running at 210 percent efficiency granted that's pulling out a lot more heat but the efficiency is worse at 17 degrees i believe that's around 400 percent or 450 percent full blast i'm saying full bore because that's how this system is pretty much going to run the fujitsu which has a higher seasonal factor at full bore is like 250 or 260 at 17 degrees not that great pretty big difference probably 35 40 percent less efficient now at 47 degrees I don't care, right? Who uses a lot of heat at 47 degrees? Nobody. So the LG, for anybody looking to heat a space and you know your heated value, that's the unit to go with, 100%. Because when your heat demand is the highest and you're pulling the amount of usage, that one is always going to run 30 to 40% more efficient than that one. But back to the unit. So it's plumbed in just like a regular unit. Uh, I mean, you have your suction line. That's the one that's insulated because I don't care about the liquid line. I'm never, I'm not using that for AC. And uh, I just have a meter on it so I can see what I'm using and I'll tuck this away. And, I mean, just 100% normal unit. You will get a lot of condensation. You can even see the sun is still dripping there. So you're going to... I mean, I just have this gutter runoff just like I have for my Fujitsu. And then in the wintertime, I take a long drainage pipe and I run it all the way out so it's not running under my deck or rotting my posts out. Yes, this is a cop job. I had my brother-in-law home, so he gave me a hand. So I just made the mock-up frame so I can get it up there and then I'll have to make a normal cross member here just so it's not looking obnoxious. But uh, what did it pull when I first filled up the tank? Efficiency was around 650% for 80 gallons, heating it to 125 degrees. Um, very good. I mean, I know it was a 60, 65 degree day yesterday. So it's going to get worse, but it's still going to be better than anything. But the, the re, how, how do you say that? The, the speed at which it recuperates is extremely fast. I wouldn't say a degree a minute, but maybe every two minutes a degree. So if you're above 50 degrees outside temperature, it is very fast at recuperating the temperature. Now as for the tank, because uh, the heating element is a whole coil that's over the whole height of the tank, well, about a first top third, I didn't put coil in there, you're going to get stratification, not when you heat it, because when you heat it, you actually get almost perfectly even temperature in the tank. But as soon as you start using water, the cold water drop tube goes almost to the bottom of the tank and your cold water will separate and it'll sit on the bottom. So if you grab your drain valve on the bottom of the tank, after five minutes of using hot water, it's cold. Why? Because um, cold water is sitting there. Normally your electric water heater has two elements, the top and the bottom. The top one never turns on unless the bottom one can't keep up with satisfying your temperature setting. So you hit 120 degrees and now your bottom thermostat is the one that's only going to work. If your bottom can't keep the tank at 120, because if the bottom's at 120, the top will be, then the bottom one gives up and there's a switch and it says, let's at least keep the top half 120 because it'll keep the top half 120 a lot easier than the whole tank. With this setup, you have your temperature sensor on the top half of the tank where the original thermostat is on the top in the first coil. Because of that, you will have a fairly cool bottom half of the tank before your temperature sensor calls for heat. And when it calls for heat, you've probably used up, I don't know, I'm just going to say 50%. I don't know how, how harsh that stratification is. But 50%, let's say, of the heat, where enough cold water will push up on the bottom to dilute the top half down to 115. That's what I have mine set on. And then 
when it heats it, it'll heat the whole tank back to 125, it will. So basically it's gonna work a little bit different. So if you're gonna see that your on setting isn't keeping up with your demand, just set the temperature up a little bit higher or if you feel like it, put your thermostat on the bottom. But if you do, you're, what you're gonna have is a heat pump that's always gonna be turning on. As soon as you start using cold water, well, hot water, the cold water is going to the tank, instantly it's gonna say, hey, the water's cold, it's gonna turn on. You don't need to do that. With 80 gallons, you got plenty to go, you know, go do your dishes, run a few showers by the time you've used up your water and then it'll turn on. It recuperates totally fast enough. So this is just a informational video. Um, system works very well. Uh, you guys see how it's done. I have a couple other videos showing how I did it. CPVC is what I used to make my, uh, it was just four pipes cross connected in between and that's what I wrapped my 13 inch coil. That's the diameter of the coil. That's what I wrapped and I dropped into the tank. So CPVC is non-toxic and uh, I used copper wire to secure the coil to the CPVC rack. That way it doesn't move around and it's always sitting the way I set it up. So everything is just the way you would see and use in your house, copper pipes, you know, it's not, it's not toxic or anything. Um, but the other thing is just don't connect your copper to a steel fitting anywhere or even stainless steel. You want to have the joint between your copper pipe and steel or stainless steel. You want that to be brass because brass doesn't react to steel and brass doesn't react to copper, but copper will react to steel. So make sure every connection between your copper, wherever, if it's touching steel, that uh, there is you know, a, a brass fitting there. So when you are connecting your lines and they're going through your tank in the bottom or out the top, you want to set everything up to make sure that that copper pipe won't be touching the edge of the thread. Because if it is, you you might have an issue after some time where that copper will just, it will rot away.